Dr. Sherry Pickover. I'm the program director for the Central Michigan University Counseling Program. And we're so thrilled that you're here today for our webinar. I'm gonna be going through some information on this PowerPoint and you're gonna have an opportunity to hear from three of our alumni, each in a different concentration. I'll also be monitoring the chat and um, I'm gonna have some help with that as I go. So as questions come up, please feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat. And um, Lindsay Kromanowski is our wonderful co-host today. Uh, was there anything you wanted to um, say, Lindsay, before we get started? Yeah, I'll introduce myself. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lindsay Karmanowski and I'm the Assistant Director of Enrollment for CMU's Global Campus in Grand Rapids. So I assist online students and students within the West Michigan region. Great. So our Central Michigan University Counseling Program. Become a licensed professional counselor. Are you interested in helping children, teens, adults, families with mental health or substance use concerns in a school or agency setting? Do you notice people telling you their problems all the time and saying, you're a great listener? Are you passionate about health advocacy and wanna help change mental health stigma? And did you meet a school counselor, an addiction counselor, a clinical mental health counselor, a college counselor, someone in your life who changed someone's life for the better. So these are a lot of reasons that people decide to become counselors. So what are some of the nuts and bolts about counseling? Well, as you can imagine right now, there is a staggering need for mental health professionals. It is the top 20 growing professions at 25% expected growth rate. That's by the US Department of Labor. The Michigan average salary for a mental health counselor is 62,000, and the medium, median salary for school counselors in the US is 58,000. SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration project, project a need for 700,000 more mental health professionals in the next five years. I can speak also anecdotally that in Michigan right now, there are sign-on bonuses I've been a counselor in Michigan for about 30 years. I have never witnessed the need and I have um, never witnessed the difficulty with recruitment. Um, so the need all over the country is really staggering. It's really staggering right now in Michigan. And I do believe that one of the, if you can call it a silver lining of the pandemic has been the explosion of telemental health. And one of the things I'll talk about a little later is every um, faculty at Central Michigan University is a board certified telemental health provider and we train our students in telemental health. So where do we work? Well, counselors work in schools, community colleges, universities, hospitals, substance abuse and mental health treatment agencies, uh, residential treatment centers, crisis-focused organizations like domestic violence shelters, runaway shelters, human trafficking support. My very first job was in a runaway shelter. They certainly work in private practice, either by themselves or in large collaboratives. They work at child welfare agencies and then in community-based practices like um, community mental health. What do counselors do? Now, obviously we can't tell you everything they do in three little bullet points, but this is just a general overview. So school counselors provide academic and career planning, classroom lessons, short-term counseling, and crisis management. Addiction counselors provide crisis management, individual group and family counseling for individuals with substance use disorders. And they also work with individuals with mental health disorders who also have a substance use concern Clinical mental health counselors provide crisis management, individual group, family counseling for individuals with mental health disorders. Counselors advocate for their students and clients and everyone with mental health concerns to reduce stigma and increase access to services. 
So for some reason, every time I click, it's not letting me, there we go. So I want to introduce you to our panelists. We're really excited to have them here. So Isaac Dieterman is an alumni of the CMU Counseling Program in Addiction Concentration. He has an MA. He is a limited licensed professional counselor and a certified alcohol and drug counselor. Romaria Jones has an MA, also a recent alumni. She is a limited licensed professional counselor and um, she also is a school counselor. We probably should have put that on there. And she's in the school counseling concentration. She has a license in school counseling. And Tesla Gerheiser has a master's degree, a limited licensed professional counselor, and she was in our clinical mental health counseling concentration. So right now I'm gonna ask each of them to answer this question. Um, and then go in any order. And then when you do, though, if you can, again, just identify yourself and then tell anybody in, in the webinar what you would like them to know about yourselves. So start with, if you could, please describe the rewards and challenges of working as a professional counselor. And we'll start with Romeria. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Romeria. I am a school counselor. Um, and I'm going to start with the rewards. Um, I work at an elementary school, so I'm at a K-5 school. We also have TK and World of Floors, so some of the younger kids. So for me, probably my greatest reward is the little hugs I get every day, all day long. So um, it makes the tough days easier, um, and it keeps us coming back, or keeps me coming back at least, I should say. Um, from the more professional side of things, some of the rewards that I enjoy it's seeing the progress. So I got I came into um, school counseling because I wanted to help. I wanted to make an impact. And I can see that um, a lot of times progress is slow and it's small, but when you see it, it's a big thing and it really fills my heart. Um, and so overall, the reward of the job is making a difference because no matter how small it is, I know that I am having an impact on my students. Um, and also the community members that I, I interact with, the staff members, and the parents, because I'm also changing, like they were saying, the, the stigma with mental health um, and also a, a, a having a positive experience with a counselor, a school counselor. And that changes a lot of things as well, just getting to see what we do and what we can do. Um, when it comes to challenges, there's there, there are a few, right, <laughs> as in anything. Um, but I, I would say my number one challenge is it's just not enough of me, just to be honest. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. And um, unfortunately, in my building, I am the only counselor. Um, we don't have a vacancy. That's just how our district does it. Um, so there's approximately 450 students that are on my caseload, per se. Um, and it's just me. So there's never enough time in the day to see every student and, and issue that I need to deal with in a day. So it's a lot of prioritizing. Um, if anyone has ever researched uh, school counseling, the National Association of School Counselors have said that we should be about 250 students to one, which is still a lot of students, but it's far more manageable. Um, so it's my school really needs almost two counselors and it's just me. Um, so that's the biggest issue. Uh, the second issue or challenge would be others not really understanding who we are as school counselors. So it's a lot of education in that because um, depending on your experience with the school counselor, depending on your knowledge of what a school counselor do, uh, there are staff members who think we do one thing and only one thing, or they think we do this and it's not a part of our job. Um, so educating the adults around me as well as to what I do is a challenge when, when you know, you came into the profession to work with students. So, <laughs> you know, that's not a part of what we think we're going to go in as school counselors and do, but it's very well a part of our job. And then last but not least, it's working through the multiple systems that sometimes are in different school districts. So when you're advocating for your student or trying to get what you need for your students, sometimes there's different layers of, of systems that you need to get through in order to get what the students need. And that can be a challenge as well. Wonderful, thank you. I'm gonna move over to Tesla. 
Hi everybody, my name is Tesla and I graduated from CMU in 2020. Um, I currently work in a group private practice in East Lansing um, and I specialize in women specific issues. Um, I will start out with some of the rewards of being a counselor and this is what Romaria is saying. The work itself is so wonderful. We get to hold space for another human being and we're giving them permission and a spot to be vulnerable and heal and saying that you're worthy of having a safe spot to process emotions and your experiences. So I would say that the best part of being a counselor is the people that you meet and you're always learning from your clients. Um, one of the challenges, and it may sound cliche, but one of the challenges as a counselor is prioritizing paperwork. It is so necessary, however, it is non-billable, it's on your own time, and you have to find a system that really works for you. So, you know, I have set time limits for myself. 12 minutes is all I can spend on a note. If you are a counselor that sees up to 30 clients a week, which is, you know, average, um, if you spend 30 minutes per note, that's up to 15 hours in paperwork. So you really have to work on prioritizing um, client care and then also being able to balance your own needs. I would say something that I knew in graduate school was that I didn't want to be a counselor that felt burnt out and compassion fatigue. I wanted to do something that felt good and aligned with my family. Um, Challenging is when <laughs> you want to help people. That is your natural born talent that you want to walk alongside these people. But also you have to get to know yourself as a therapist and what you can do. And even if you can do it, doesn't mean that you're always the best person to support that. Thank you so much. And um, Isaac. My name is Isaac Dieterman. Um, I graduated from Central's counseling program in March of this year. Um, I obtained my LLPC in June and I work, I'm an outpatient therapist at 1016 Recovery Network in Clare, Michigan. Um, I would say, you know, kind of to echo what I've already heard a little bit is one of the major rewards that I see is uh, I work in the addiction field and so when my clients come to me initially um, they're often at their probably the lowest point that they've ever been in their lives and um, just watching some of my clients go from being absolutely broken to building themselves back up into an even better version than they probably ever have been <clears throat> just being able to be a part of that is so rewarding i can't even put it into words um but also uh similarly a challenge with this is that uh, many people you know i deal with clients who don't want to change i deal with clients who um can't or won't for some reason and that is very hard to watch you know watch them continue um in their addiction but uh, oftentimes, you know, people at least gain something from treatment and they're a little bit better off than they ever were. Um, working in the addiction field is is very rewarding and very challenging at the same time. I have to echo also what Tesla said about notes. When I decided to become a counselor, when I got sober myself from alcoholism in 2015, I thought that it would be me just, you know, 40 hours a week meeting with 40 clients per week. That is not what's true. I meet with about 25 maybe a week and the other 15 hours, some of it is spent in group therapy and the rest is spent in notes and documentation. So definitely keep that in mind. Thank you. And thanks for putting information in the chat. We are going to have a time and I will um, post questions right when we get to the end of the question answer session. So this time I'm going to start with Tesla. Um, please discuss how counselors advocate for your clients. 
Counselors can advocate in so many different ways. Um, when I was in the program, I don't know if anybody remembered, but LPCs were being threatened um, on taking some of our abilities away. So advocacy, um, I actually showed up to Lansing during a hearing and there was clients there, there were all different professionals there. So I would say just kind of being involved, being on all those groups, um, being informed on what's going on with the profession and really using your strengths as, as leverage. Um, Sometimes it is showing up to the Capitol, but other times it's just investing in training. So going to implicit bias training and becoming better, it could be displaying your license so people see that counselors are out there in the field. It doesn't always have to look like the traditional advocacy, but there's so much you can do. And I think when it comes to advocacy, um, there is a lot left on the table. So as a counselor, you may be meeting one-on-one -on -one with clients, you may be meeting with families, but outside of that, there is um, so many different opportunities that you can get involved in. Thanks, and this time, Isaac, how do you, um, how do you counsel, how do you advocate for your clients? So personally, um, I've never been passionate necessarily about um, being an advocate on a policy level, but I do find myself um, advocating for my clients often um, with probation, parole, and child protective services. Um, one story that I can quickly share is I had a client who, uh, you know, he was a guy that uh, in all appearances you'd think was a hardened um, person that had been in prison, but he came in my office and he was just bawling that he was going to go back to prison. And I advocated for him to get into recovery court in Clare County. And as a result, he in phase two of recovery court received his um, license that he hadn't had in, I believe, 11 years. And he also is going to have um, felony possession of methamphetamine um, uh, lowered to a misdemeanor charge rather than a felony. And so um, uh, that that greatly improves his um, likelihood of obtaining jobs in the future. And so, I mean, it that little bit of advocacy for that one client, and there's many more stories I could share, but that may have changed the trajectory of his life completely. And so that's one, one way that I, I try to advocate um, with the legal system, mostly in my line of work. You know, that's such an amazing point that both you and Tesla talked about, and I know Romario will in a second, that that's something counselors get to do is actually change the trajectory. Like you get to have that level of impact. So, Romario. So at the school level, um, I look at av advocation or advocating for my, my students as collaboration, because there is a lot of collaborative pieces um, and then within being collaborative, like you're dealing with other stakeholders, whether it be in the community or within the school, um, also working a lot with the parents. I think that's huge. And, and sometimes the parents are, are disconnected from the school. And so as a counselor advocating for your student in the best interest of your student, it's getting that parent involved and on board and being a part and included, um, in the team, the team of who's taking care of the kid, right? Um, I would say the biggest piece of advocating is being the child's voice. So a lot of times I put the word resistance down on my paper. Um, I'm not sure if that's the best word, but a lot of times you're the one at the table with the opposite view. So you, you know, you're in a room with a lot of educators who are looking at the best interest of the child educationally, because that's their focus, that's their expertise. And you're the one in the room that's looking at the social and emotional well-being of the child. And sometimes that puts you in an adverse position compared to everybody else. So sometimes you got to be willing to go in there and be the bad guy, unfortunately, which you're not the bad guy. But you have a lot of other educators looking at you saying, what are you saying? <laughs> what do you mean we're wrong? Um, and it's not that they're wrong. It's just they're missing 
a piece of who the child is and what the child needs. So um, that's probably the biggest part of advocating for students at the school level is being that person to say to a parent, to a principal, to whomever, no, let's consider this. Let's look at it from this standpoint. Thanks. So please describe the process of finding a job as a counselor and how you became licensed. And this time we'll start with Isaac, go to Romeria and end with Tesla. So um, finding a job as a counselor, um, as Dr. Pickover said in the very beginning of this webinar, uh, you can find a job as a counselor. I, I've said often that if I ever felt like I wanted a different job, I could go and get a job literally anywhere in the state of Michigan, probably right now. Um, the way that I came about my job as a counselor is um, I was working as a student support coordinator for uh, CM Crew, which is at Central. Um, it's for college, or college students in recovery. And they sat me down one day and asked me if I wanted to work as an outpatient therapist um, under a development plan for a CADC, Certified Alcohol Drug Counselor. Um, and so I started working as a counselor actually in 2019. And um, so I kind of came into it just as sort of an upgraded position, more or less. Um, and through that, I was able to do my practicum and internship at 1016. Um, now, as for becoming licensed, um, I basically had to go through the paperwork with Lara. Um, and I had to take the um, NCE exam back earlier this um, early spring, I think. And um, once I received that, it was just basically a waiting game until they um, uh, had their their quarterly meeting, and then short time later, the L, my uh, LLPC was in the mail, and so that's kind of the way that I did it. But uh, like I said, getting a job in this field is quite easy. I've actually had one one person um, reach out to me even on LinkedIn and offered me a job at private practice. Of course, at the time, I didn't have a limited license, nor was I interested, but um, uh, that, you know, I could have easily jumped into a job somewhere else had I had my license at the time. Um, so it's definitely possible um, to find a job in many different areas. So I echo the same experience. Um, it is incredibly um, easy to, well, I wouldn't say easy, but the need for school counselors is there. There are openings everywhere, unfilled openings. Um, I received my job through internships. So I had an internship um, at a high school within the district that I worked in. The elementary position became open just so happened while I was there. Um, and my supervisor um, felt like I was a good fit for the job and, and prompted me to apply, which I did. And I was able to get the job. Now I was still in internship. Um, so I completed my internship hours with the elementary school. However, prior to starting internship, I was able to take my MTTC. So Michigan teachers, there's another 10 there certification, certification test for school counseling. Um, I passed that test. And because there's such a great need in Michigan for school counselors, there is a little program that Dr. Pickover will be able to talk to you about that allowed me to get a temporary license before even starting my internship. So due to the fact that I had the license for, to be a school counselor, um, I was able to take that job before finishing my internship and becoming fully licensed. Um, once I completed my internship and my hours, I the Michigan Department of Education has a very good walk through of everything that you need to do, but one is taking that test and passing it, which I had already done. Um, there is an application, online application that you fill out. Um, they send some information to the school to get a verification. And then it's after that, you just get your license in the mail if everything checks out. Um, I'm also the LLPC. So my experience with that is very similar to Isaac's where um, you sent in your information to Laura and then it's a waiting game. But now that we're k up those days are gone, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs>
So the process of finding a job for me, I feel as though I had some advantages. I was in the field for about seven years before canned doing various things. I was in a hospital setting and I was a liaison and I responded to crisis in the hospital, which was basically just showing compassion and empathy to families that had come in when something so terrible had happened. And then I moved over and I worked in a medication assisted treatment program working with substance use. And then I went to a home-based therapy program when I did internship. So when I was in the process of finding a job, my resume really did look like I was interested and well-versed. And I did take advantage of all of the opportunities at CMU. There is um, a handshake application or a meeting you can go to, and they will critique your resume and they'll tell you some words to put in there and what to leave out and what to highlight. Sometimes you don't even realize the accomplishments that you're making in graduate school because your head is so focused on getting that master's degree. So it was really helpful to have someone walk alongside you in that process. Um, so when I was in the process of finding a job, I absolutely knew what I didn't want to do. My experiences kind of shaped that for me. And so I had a lot of interviews, but I was very picky. I was offered every job that I went into. And it's kind of intimidating being the new counselor, turning down opportunities because something is better than nothing, right? But... I am so much more happier now because I waited for that opportunity. I was only without a job for about a month. And that's because of paperwork. Paperwork can take some time to get set up, but also having a break after you just finished this crazy master's program. Crazy good. Um, it was nice. It was really nice to reflect on what I wanted to do next and to be clear minded when I went into my new role. So um, when I went into interviews, I sold exactly what I wanted to do. I was very authentic to what I was willing to take on, what clients I was looking to work for, and also what skills I could bring. Um, typically, you know, they want you to have knowledge of anxiety and depression, which you absolutely will. But I would encourage you guys to kind of find something more that you're really interested in working with. And for me, that was women specific. So life transitions, grief, divorce, those are all really big selling points that a lot of clients will show up in your office with. Um, and then becoming licensed. It's not bad. It's not bad at all. You're filling out paperwork, you're doing your fingerprints, you're getting your transcripts from CMU. Everything will check out. It's just being able to stay patient while you are waiting for that all to come through. Great, and, um, oh. Okay, finally, I keep, I, I apologize, I keep clicking the button that makes it big <laughs> instead of just going to next. So, um, there we go, <laughs> follow my mouse. And so our final question, and then please put some questions in the um, chat because we'll have an opportunity after they ask this one to ask the questions that um, you wanna ask. And then right after that, I'll go through our um, program in Mount Pleasant and the, our new online program that we're launching in fall of 2022. So please talk about your experience in the CMU counseling program and then what advice would you give to someone thinking about attending the program? And this time we'll just go with um, Tesla, Isaac, and then Romeria. Okay, so my experience in the counseling program is that I was in a cohort in Grand Rapids with about 12 other students. Um, my classes were on Friday nights and Saturdays, which still allowed me to be at home with my family throughout the week. And then also um, just to have balance so I could still earn income. It's very important that you're able to create some of that balance with being able to go to school, but also your jobs and responsibilities at home. 
it was an absolute wonderful experience in the program. And I was able to succeed in a lot of my classes. And I think a lot of that has to do with becoming close with my professors and my cohort. Um, when our cohort got together, we set up a private group on Facebook. So we talked and we sent memes and we collaborated on Sunday nights about what projects were due and how far along you were. And we supported each other. And even now we'll post in the group and be like, yay, I'm expecting. And it's, it's so comforting to have those counselors because when you're done with school, you still need counselor friends <laughs> in the field. You need to talk about things that are bothering you or, hey, can I run this by you? Or, hey, have you ever seen this in a client before? Because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> so it's really nice to have that group of people. And some of my advice in the program is that as a counselor, you are naturally caring and empathetic, but sometimes also you will have qualities of perfectionism. It's a strength, but also it can cause some stress. So my advice to you guys is to think of this as a developmental process. You are going to be a better counselor five years down the road than you are in the program. Babies have to crawl before they walk and counselors have to grow in the same way. I remember feeling so anxious in my first year. I just can't wait to be done. I, I just want to be out there and help people. And you will feel that way too. But you're growing and you're learning and you are a good person and you will do good work. So that would be my advice is have a community and also just know that taking it step by step, course by course. So um, I started my journey at CMU's counseling program in the spring of 2019 after going through the GRE and um, all of the other uh, paperwork and such. And I got accepted. And um, once I once I started going through the program, I was very nervous reading all of these like CED 600 level classes. I remember thinking like, oh, my gosh. I remember some 200 level classes that were just brutal, but, uh, you know, once I got in it, I realized, you know, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is the stuff I'm interested in. You know, we started going through the techniques and we started, uh, going through the theory, uh, and learning like more in depth about solution focus, cognitive behavioral, um, all these different things. And I found myself just, uh, always so like wanting to learn more, um, you know, and I did, I learned a lot from many of my professors at CMU. Um, we, I was in a cohort that was right in the middle of the pandemic. And so we switched um, to mostly virtual, which um, was challenging, but it also, I think we were very resilient, um, me and my other cohort members. And, you know, um, I, I really think that what Tesla said is, is true, that um, having that community um, there's two people that um, are in my cohort or were in my cohort that I currently, well, I work with one of them and one of them did work with us until she got sick. Um, so I've, I've kept in contact with two of my cohort members and they work in the same agency as I do. Um, and I also keep in touch with others um, from my cohort that ask me questions about addiction and stuff like that. And I'm just, I, I ask questions about you know, some um, uh, mental health that I don't typically deal with. Um, so it's just great to be able to bounce ideas off of and, and uh, just kind of feel validated as well, um, because we do go through that imposter syndrome. It's like, what am I doing as a counselor? Am I a counselor? I know I went through the school or, the, you know, all the college and everything else, but am I actually a counselor? Am I able to do this? And, you know, sometimes just hearing from one of your peers, it's like, you're doing good. I'm feeling the exact same way at times, but this is how I dealt with it. You know, that really helps you uh, keep moving forward as a counselor and not get burnt out. Um, a big piece of advice from my personal story um, with attending the program is 
So I, on a whim, um, applied for, it's called the NBCC, so that's the National Board of Certified Counselors um, a Minority Fellowship Program um, for Addiction Counselors. So that's called it's MFP-AC. Um, if you look this up on Google, you could also apply for it. Um, it's, it's a great deal of paperwork. Um, and I did it like two days before it was due and had to get Dr. Pick over to help me. And I think one other, or Dr. Uh, I can't remember McGlasson, Dr. McGlasson helped me out too. Like the, literally the minute before almost. <laughs> And Dr. Pickover graciously helped me out on a Sunday, I remember. And she sent back this signed document to me. I got everything in, got my background check and all these things done. And I very much did not think that I was going to um, get accepted into this program because I didn't believe I was a part of a minority group until I remembered that I was a person in long term recovery from alcoholism. And there's not many of us out there. So, just to say, if you're thinking about going into the addiction field, I strongly suggest that you apply for this NBCC um, Minority Fellowship Program for Addiction Counselors. I was afforded $15,000 towards my education that I did not have to pay back, um, which that was, I think I figured that it was about, I think about half of my degree. This is a big deal. And not only that, but you get memberships to NADAC. You also get um, tons of training. Uh, I had mine up virtually um, because of COVID, but they will fly you out to Washington, D.C. or Atlanta, Georgia, and you get to go to symposiums, um, Bridging the Gap symposiums that talk a lot about multicultural issues as well as mental health and addiction. Um, I cannot advocate for this enough. Um, this was a complete game changer for me as a as a as a college student. Um, and you know. Isaac, thank you so much. I'm just I am going to pass it over to Romaria because I do want to make sure we get to the next part. So Romaria, I'm yep. going to give you about two minutes. Okay, so um, I'm going to give you my truth. The program is tough. It's rig rigorous, but it is absolutely a hundred percent worth it. Um, you will run into students from, especially in the, the school, um, a concentration from other schools, and you'll hear about the things they're doing and the way they're able to take their classes, and you'll be like, oh, maybe I chose the wrong program. But at the end, I know I chose the right program. Um, you get what you need from this program. It's rigorous. It's tough. You're going to have those days where you're just like, I cannot do this. I don't have the time. I don't have the patience. But somehow you make it through. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you'll be so happy because you did the right thing. The advice that I would give um, anyone right now is to be prepared to evolve. So a part of the counseling program, and I don't think anybody told us this in the beginning, but it's something that I know now, is that you as a person involves during this program. The way you view the world, the way you see things and you approach things is going to change. You're not going to be the same person personally or professionally that you were when you entered the program. And that in itself is rewarding. Thanks. So I'm going to hold the questions just um, to the end because I want to make sure I do cover some information about our program and then leave enough time at the end and I'll go ahead and post those questions that are in the chat and more as they come up. So just to tell you about our CMU counseling program, we are KCREP accredited in Mount Pleasant, Southfield, and Grand Rapids. It's a 60 credit program for all three concentrations that we offer. In Mount Pleasant, it's a full-time program, nine credits a semester, that's year round. Um, our courses are either face-to-face, -face, um, they're either eight weeks, 12 weeks, or 16 weeks long, depending on when you go, the summer is 12 weeks. Um, and we also have asynchronous online courses for our part-time online program that we are launching in fall of 2022. You will have live online courses, just like this webinar, where you meet with your faculty and attend class and then asynchronous online classes. Those courses will either be eight weeks or 16 weeks long. All the courses in the part-time cohort and most of them all in Mount Pleasant as well are evening. 
So in the online, the live classes will all be to either Tuesday or Thursday, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, oh, see, I keep clicking the wrong button. Sorry about that. So we also, re you're required to do a 100-hour practicum, which is a pretty intense um, experience where you're actually going to sit down and counsel real live honest to gosh people clients you'll have tons of support you're videotaped you have two and a half hours of supervision a week students can do that through telemental health if they're in the online program through our center for community counseling and development and if you're in mount pleasant they do that on site as well and then you'll do a 600 hour internship in either a school setting if you're a school counselor an addiction setting if you're in addiction concentration or a clinical mental health setting if you're in clinical mental health. Now, people are asking about questions about, well, I'm full time, I work full time, how do I do an internship? And I will tell you right now that the internships where you do them after five and on the weekends don't exist. Those supervisors work when you work, but anybody who applies to the program knows that it's 60 credits in Mount Pleasant, it's two years, the part-time program is three to three and a half years. You have plenty of time to plot it out and figure out how you're going to adjust your life. But you will have to because you are required to work when a supervisor is present on site. And you're also always welcome me to email me at any time to ask more questions. All our concentrations lead to the LLPC licensure in Michigan, the addiction counseling certification, also leads to the CAADC, which is a certified advanced alcohol and drug counselor. And the school counseling concentration leads to a school counselor license, or you have an NT endorsement on your teaching certificate. So if you're interested in applying, we do not require the GRE. We have a 2.8 GPA. We request two professional letters of recommendation a statement of purpose that needs to be an APA 7th edition. You can find all kinds of information about 7th edition APA online. You're going to state your career goals, describe how completing the MA in counseling will help you fulfill those goals, and describe your strengths and areas for growth as a graduate student. So now I'm gonna go ahead to the questions. I wanted to make sure I went, and I'm sure many of you have some great questions that I wanted to pose to the panel and wanted enough time. So I'm gonna to go to the first one, and anybody's welcome to answer this. What boundaries and self-care do you set to process your potential overload per day, per week, and per month? I'll go, I'll go first for this one anyway. So this has been a very, um, big topic for me this school year because in my district and so many districts, this is our first year back face to face and this is my first school year face to face. Um, so the need is significant within the schools. There are a lot of issues within the school. Um, my day is busy. I am up and out the whole entire day. So for me, my self care this year is literally when I walk out the door, I'm done. Like I'm not taking um, work home. I'm not checking work emails. You know, if there's a parent that I need to call, if I don't make that call before I walk out the door, that call is not going to be made and I must do it. So I have my email set to automatically shut off at a certain time. Um, even if it's a text message from my, my superior, that message will not be answered unless it's a absolute emergency until the next morning uh, when it's time for me to be at work or when I'm at work. So that's my level of self-care um, this year to ensure that burnout, burnout doesn't happen. I could also speak to that. I know about myself that I don't like working full-time. So I work on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday only. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm available in the office, and on Wednesdays, I do telehealth. I think what's really important, um, I have an intake coordinator that reaches out to me all the time. Tesla, someone saw you. They want to see you. Um, it's exactly what you like. It's an adult. It's a female. It's women. It's 
um, anxiety, depression, life transitions. And sometimes that sounds so good, but also having my limits. If I don't have space, and space means like on my caseload in my schedule, but if I don't have space in, you know, my heart, in the work that I do, I just can't take them on. So that is also an option to create your limits and sticking with them. And also how to communicate that to intake coordinators. You'll feel pressure, but you might want to say, thank you for thinking of me, but I'm unable to right now, maybe in the next month. And just really quick, use accurate empathy. What does that mean? That means we, we cannot be over involved in a client's life. We cannot take on their trauma and bring it home with us because it will cause burnout and you will be leaving the field after a time. Um, you know, it's okay to care for somebody, but um, just remember that at the end of the day, you have your own things you have to deal with and they have their things that they have to deal with and you are only just a part of their healing. They have to do the big work. That is amazing advice. <laughs> So can specializations like women's issues occur during the program, or is it something that comes after the degree? I'm, I'm going to touch on that a little bit, but I'd also like you guys to, to um, kind of speak as well. You know, it's interesting, becoming a counselor and getting your master's degree is learning what you don't know, right? Which sounds really bizarre. So when you think about counseling, like any health profession, we always talk about it as a practice, right? Nurses practice, doctors practice, counselors practice. Well, what does that mean? Well, you're still practicing. So the, the trajectory is to just learn and keep learning. I, I remember once seeing a, um, a quote, and I can't remember where it came from, but it said, once you're through learning, you're through. So know that when you're in the counseling program, we're going to teach you um, about working with couples and families. We're going to teach you about doing trauma and crisis counseling. If you're interested in addiction counseling, we're going to teach you that. There is no way in 60 credits we can ever teach you everything that you need to know. Your clients do that. Your research does that as, as you kind of move forward. Um, but you certainly have the ability during the program, if there's something you're passionate about, every research paper you do can be tied to that interest. So does anybody else kind of wanted to comment on that? I'll say something really fast. Um, you know, getting your CADC or CAADC, for those uh, that will have master's degrees at the end, um, you know, you have to go through McBAP and it is, it's like an additional thing that you have to do. It's not, um, you know, it's mainly just getting hours, supervision hours and um, the education as well. If any of you have gone through Central's uh, minor in SUD, substance use disorder, um, that education counts for the entirety of your um, CADC. And I'll just say that, um, oh God, I just lost my train of thought. I'll just say that school counseling, for the school counseling track, um, what we have, there was four, I believe four specific school counseling classes. And in those class, classes, we were allowed to choose like the level or the population that we focus the classwork on. However, I will say this. I always chose high school because I thought that's what I wanted. That is what I chose. Don't give me middle school. Don't give me elementary. And the first thing I ended up in was elementary. So I'll say to this point, you may have an area you prefer to work in, but it is best practice to get all you can get. You can't get everything, but get as much variety as you can because you don't know what opportunity is going to meet you outside that door. And to end, I would say, <laughs> just throw this in here, that a piece of advice that I should have gave at the beginning is hold on to your books because you use them more after than you do when you're in class. It is constant new learning. What an excellent point. You know, I've always said, the thing you're most afraid of is what comes down and sits in front of you. <laughs> so if you're coming to be a counselor and go, yeah, but I only wanna work with, um, I, I would say just 
absolutely, like they said, go in with an open mind. I just want to make sure there was a question about not having prior experience. And, um, you know, here you see people who on our panel, one was already working in a school, one already had prior experience. Isaac, uh, you know, Tesla did, Isaac did. But the reality is a vast majority of our students do not. Many of them, we right now have a, uh, two students in Homeland Security, a student in IT, um, and students from just really all different walks of life who decide they want to do something different. And so I'm gathering that's where many of you are right now if you're here in this webinar. Um, it's not a prerequisite. It's a good idea to get some experience if you can, just so that you know this is the right field for you, because we can talk to you about it, but at the end of the day, you certainly learn more by doing. But it's not a prerequisite, and some of the best counselors I've ever worked with are ones who came from completely different fields. And to pick over, I was a secretary. No previous experience before internship. I was a secretary in the school. My undergrad is in business management no psychology in sight for me until I decided to come into this program. Great point. And then I just wanted to make sure. So, and please let me know if I'm not answering your questions. And then is it a growing field? Is it true for specializations? It, yeah, any, anywhere. I, there is such a dramatic need right now that you can um, specialize just in an, um, obsessive compulsive disorder and you'll have tons of clients. You can specialize just in families. You can specialize just in men's issues, women's issues. You could specialize just in gambling alone. Um, the need right now is just really staggering. Oh, what a great question. If you're interested in mental health but would like to work in the schools. So, um, if you want to be a school counselor, you have to have a school counseling license. You have to have a school counseling degree. Um, that's a requirement in most states. But there are, interestingly enough, specifically in Michigan, clinical mental health counselors who are then placed in the school to do clinical mental health work. They're all over um, the state right now. So you can be a clinical mental health counselor and work with children. Um, and you can even work with children in the schools, but you can't be a specific school counselor. Um, if you want to be a school counselor, you have to have the school counseling concentration. But what's neat about our program is you're also eligible for that professional license in Michigan and in some other states as well. And which means that you can work in a clinical mental health setting as well as a school setting. Okay, we have just a few minutes left. Any other questions for myself or the panel? Well, if nothing's coming through and we do have five minutes, I just wanted to, um, on the advice that I would give to anybody interested in coming into a counseling program, um, I would say look at your life and decide what you're going to give up. Because I think the biggest mistake people make when they go to graduate school is going, I'll just fit it in to the nine million other things I'm already doing. And you have to remember it's temporary, it's short term, but um, it will take up a bit of your life. And so just kind of making that preparation for it, that space for it. And since we have a few minutes left, is there anything the panel would like to kind of have a final thought on? I'll just say I'm glad I went to CMU. Um, you know, it was... It was in a good location for me um, and it provided me so many different opportunities to get to where I am today. And this is quite literally when I got sober, this is exactly what I wanted to do. And CMU's counseling program was just another step for me to get to where I am today. And it's, I mean, this is the main goal that I've had in my life.
Yes, I could agree with that, Isaac. This program was so meaningful to me. And there's a reason why Isaac, me, and Romaria keep coming back <laughs> because we enjoyed our time and it was purposeful. Um, as Dr. Pickover said, sacrifice. It is going to have to be there. Goodbye Sunday nights when you have to turn in your assignments. But you will do it. If this is honestly something that you desire and you want to show the world that compassion and empathy still exist, this program would be a good fit. So thanks so much for letting me share a little bit about my life. And it's always nice to kind of come back and reconnect. I'll just echo the same sentiments. Um, this is a wonderful program, CMU. I am so happy. Like I said, I'm just telling my truth. In the beginning, I didn't know. But at the end, I know that I made the best decision. It's one of the best programs around, especially for school counseling. Um, and then I have to plug school counseling. We need you. So if you're interested in school counseling, please apply. Please give it a try because the need is great and we need we need mental health counselors, we need addiction, but the school needs you as well. So if there's anything I want to leave with is that if you have an interest, please dig deeper, please seek it out and come join me. I would be more than welcome to welcome anyone. Thank you guys so much. That was a great question in there about application. The applications are open right now for fall of 2022. Our, um, Deadline for Mount Pleasant is February 1st, 2022. And for our online program, we have a priority review of March 1st, but it will stay open until the cohorts are full. Um, if you know anybody who didn't attend this webinar and they are interested in our online or Mount Pleasant program, please feel free to have them reach out. This is being recorded. They'll be able to watch. You can contact me. That's my email right there. I'm the program director. Um, if you go online to our website, you'll also see the director for school counseling is Dr. Ellen Armbruster. And for clinical mental health counseling, it's Dr. Allison Arnacrans. And for addiction counseling is Dr. Herber LaPierre. All of their contact information is right on our website. Or if you can't remember any of that and three letters are easier, you can just contact CSE at CMISH.edu and it will get to who needs to get to. Um, we will consider individuals who have um, GPAs below the 2.8 cutoff. Um, we encourage everyone who's interested to apply. We need counselors. And if there's no other questions, I believe we're right at eight o'clock. <laughs>